full theory graphs, calculating the effective theory graphs using the same infrared regulator. We're normalizing each of them separately and then subtracting them to figure out higher order corrections to the Wilson coefficients. And as part of that dis discussion, we also talked about scheme dependence because when you do that procedure of a normalization in the effective theory, you're making a choice for the scheme. We picked MS bar, but you could pick other choices. And at the end of lecture, we talked about the fact that when you make that different scheme choices, it can affect things. So it can affect the Wilson coefficients. It can affect, it'll affect the matrix elements of operators. It'll affect your matching coefficients at one loop and your anomalous dimensions at two loops. But those scheme dependencies cancel out in observables. So it's important to take the scheme into account and work in the same scheme, but if you consistently use the same scheme for everything, then you will be okay. Now, if you're just doing calculations on pen and paper, it's very easy that you just, well, we love the MS bar scheme, let's use that. But remember that sometimes there will be things in your result that you may want to get from elsewhere. For example, maybe there's some matrix elements of the operators, you want to get them from the lattice. Well, if you look up results in the lattice, they're not using MS bar. There's no non-perturbative definition of MS bar. So they'll be using some other scheme and those, that, those results will have to be converted to MS bar if you're going to put them together with your results. Okay, so that's just something to be aware of. Before we leave this topic and go on to something else, I thought I'd say a few words about phenomenology. What is all this technology good for? So a nice example of that is BDAS gamma. So BDAS gamma, it's a neutral current process. It doesn't happen in the Steiner model at tree level. And therefore what that means if it doesn't happen at tree level is that it's sensitive to loop corrections. And you could go, since it's you know, we talked about a channel with B to C, U bar D, but this is very analogous. We have a B, B meson in the initial, B quark in the initial state, so it's the same scales in the problem. Effectively, the B quark scale is the, is the light scale. We want to get rid of the things that would mediate this decay that are inside the loop, which will be W bosons and top quarks in this example. And so you draw this in the standard model. There's various diagrams that contribute one is this one. So here's a B quark changing into a strange quark through a top quark and a W. And if we integrate out the, the W in the top, then we get some local operator, much as we were talking about in our examples up here. Uh, it's just that we have different diagrams. And we can also, from the low energy point of view, enumerate the operators. For some reason, I started calling them Q instead of E, I mean, instead of O. Let me give you an example of some of these operators. So here's what you would call a magnetic dipole operator, couples directly to the photon, which is in the F mu and it takes the B to an S bar, and that's, that's an example of a higher dimension operator. Remember, this is dimension two, and then plus three there, so that's five. There's a factor of the B quark mass that just comes in because of the chiral structure of the operator, which you can think of as there needs to be a mass insertion here. You need one factor of that mass in order for the diagram not to give zero. If you really start to do B dash gamma and you want to go through the whole story, then you have to actually think about other operators, and there's a whole basis of them. And one thing you could do is you could take the operator up there and just replace the photon by a gluon. That won't give a tree level contribution to B dash gamma, but these guys are charged under electromagnetism, so you could just have a direct coupling to the B quark or the a strange quark, and then loop up the gluon and get a, a correction from an operator like this one. And then there's also four quark operators, like the ones we talked about before. But 
with just different flavors. And if you enumerate all of them, there's nine more. Different ways of making four quark operators. Okay, so you can build some basis using the equation of motion to simplify the operators as much as possible, and then you get down to these ones. And you can go through the program that we talked about of doing matching and renormalization group evolution. And really what I want to talk about here is a little bit about phenomenology because the interesting thing about this loop is that if, it, if there was new physics, since, it tree, since in the standard model at tree level it doesn't happen, if there's new physics then you can be sensitive to it here because you, you're sensitive to heavy particles in this loop. That's why BDES gamma is always used to constrain new physics. So in our effective theory we have just a operator that does this. which is this 07, gamma. And if you think about what C7 gamma is at lowest order, well, let's just calculate that diagram over there. And the result from doing that will be some function of MW over M top, because those are the things that are appearing in the loop. And if you do that calculation, you get a number like that, if you stick in values for M top and MW. And then you can start doing loop corrections. The first thing you might think about, which is actually not even suppressed by any factors of the coupling, alpha strong, would be to just loop up the Q1 operator, uh, which I guess, I don't know why I wrote it this way. E. You could just loop up the Q1 operator, contract the UU bar, and then you can get a B to S transition from this operator. So this is the U quark here. And then attach a photon. And there's no factor in that loop of the strong coupling, because this is an electromagnetic coupling, and this guy here is just this Q1 operator. So this doesn't look like it's loop suppressed relative to that. And this is a little subtle, but this guy actually is zero, so you have to use a good scheme for gamma 5. But it turns out to be 0. So the first type of loop corrections that you get, which are suppressed by a factor of alpha s, come from diagrams like, well, there's various diagrams, but one of them is like this, where I take the same diagram there and I attach an extra gluon on top of it. This guy diverges. And this two-loop calculation would, is order alpha strong, and it gives the leading order anomalous dimension, what we were calling gamma zero. It's not the only diagram. There's other diagrams, too. So we could go through that and do a similar type of thing, just with more diagrams than we had in our example. In particular, we could construct from the tree level matching and the one loop anomalous dimension, the leading log result. And let me just write that down for you. Putting in numbers for the anomalous dimensions. sometimes putting in numbers for them. <laughs> so the eta factor here is the ratio of alphas. So this is similar to what we saw before in our example where we got a ratio of alphas raised to a power. And if you want to pick a, a mu for this process over here, B to S gamma, then the right mu to think about is MB. So we want to take mu to be MB.
And so if I plug in numbers, and this is really what I wanted to emphasize, if I plug in numbers here for these various things, well, this guy here gives a factor of like 0.7. This guy here is this minus 0.2 that we talked about up there. This factor here is like a bit small, 0.085, 096. That's right. And then this piece here gives a substantial correction. And if I wrote down all these numbers correctly, then the final result comes out to be, if I keep three digits, minus 0.3, which you can see is a fairly substantial change from minus 0.2. It's a 50% change. So just taking into account the evolution takes us from, uh, gives a 50% correction. So if you didn't take it, take it into account and you just said, well, forget about effective theory, I just calculate this graph, that's the standard model, and that you'd think that there was new physics. We've certainly tested BDS gamma at better than 50%, at more like the 10% level. So you really have to take into account these effects that we've been talking about, like this leading log evolution, if you want to look for new physics, because you've got to get the right standard model result. So 50% larger. And actually, people go two orders beyond what I'm talking about here. They go to next, the next, the leading log order when they really do precision VDAS gamma physics. So there's some of the state of the art calculations of multi-loop diagrams have been done exactly for VDAS gamma because these effects are so important for looking for new physics. And it's even worse when you get it, put it in the branching ratio because a 50% enhancement in a coupling, when you put it in the branching ratio, you're squaring the amplitude, so that's a factor of 2.3. Okay, so these are really crucial corrections to take into account. So that's what this electric Hamiltonian is actually used for when you do phenomenology. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about the electroweak Hamiltonian, just to give you a flavor for it. There's lots more that you could do with it. We could talk about more phenomenology. But let me stop there, since the idea is to give you an introduction to the concepts, and we've done that. So now we'll move on to something else, which is a different concept, unless there's any questions. So all this business of schemes and stuff comes in when people are talking about BDS gamma and making the standard model prediction. And there's actually schemes you can pick where you mess this up, but then, and then you, if you're careful, you get the same answer in the very end.